Good morning and welcome to The Global Current. With Cameron Brown, I'm Q Mars Ahmed. First up, a piece written by staffer Arjun Donde. The double dip recession that has plagued the United Kingdom has ended. The UK's economy grew 1% between the second and third quarters. The once failing economy has begun an ascent due to the recent Olympic Games as well as the Diamond Jubilee held in the United Kingdom this past summer. This is believed to be good news politically for Prime Minister David Cameron and his coalition government. Many economists, however, believe that the British government should err on the side of caution. Jeremy Cook, a chief economist at the foreign exchange company World First, stated in a recent interview with The Independent that the underlying growth, that is, the growth in GDP measured without the effects of the Olympics and the Diamond Jubilee, is in fact much smaller. Many other economists around the world would share the same sentiment, that the new rise in GDP is largely a byproduct of the Olympic Games, and unless handled correctly, will send the UK back into an economic recession. Prime Minister David Cameron argued, however, that this growth is indicative of a greater long-term trend of positive growth, and that his government's policies are more responsible for this phenomenon as opposed to the events of the summer. Of course, there are always one-off figures in all of these um, announcements, but I think they do show an underlying picture of good and positive growth. As I said, there's still much more to be done. There's a long road to travel, but we've got the right approach. We must stick with that approach. I think these figures show we're on the right track. And they're accompanied, of course, by the fact that we've created a, a million new jobs in the private sector over the last two years. So we've got to stick with the program uh, and recognize that these figures are positive. Nonetheless, if growth continues, it could spell a problem for the opposition Labour Party. The next elections in Britain are scheduled to be held in 2015. For Arjun Dande, I'm Kumar Zamed. And now a piece on India's rising coal dependency from Russell Gouch. India's attachment to coal has never been higher. With India's high-tech industries and fast-growing cities, over 173 power plants, all of them coal-fired, will be built to power the new industries in expanding cities. Coal is one of India's key national resources and one of their main sources of energy. This has resulted in India becoming a fast-rising economic power. India's booming economy comes at the expense of human rights and environment. Some say that this has put India on a path to disaster. India's dependence on coal has led to a dirty trail of violence, landlessness, and poverty. The speed of India's growth has caused mining communities such as Changora and Sindhapuram much anxiety and violence. The communities cannot keep up with the demand of coal, and the low wages and the lack of compensation for extra efforts to meet demand have resulted in extreme poverty. Environmental effects of burning the dirty fossil fuel has caused lung ailments and breathing problems to the people living in the area. Even though India's mining communities fuel India's growing economy, these communities get the least amount of government aid. As a result, India's coal belt is experiencing significant and societal environmental issues. However, the filthy coal air that is plaguing the Indian communities are the least of the Indian government's concerns because their use to coal has allowed them to become larger players in the global stage and focus their attention to other concerns. Russell Gouch, Global Current. And now, staff for Dana Terry examines the effects of sanctions on Iran. Many valid points can be made for a multitude of arguments when it comes to Iran's nuclear program. Yet, both presidential candidates present a similar plan on how to respond. But does strengthening the broad-based sanctions touted by both candidates actually force Iran's government to halt its nuclear program or re-examine why its nuclear program is a global concern? In the final presidential debate, Governor Romney explained his plan to tighten, quote, crippling sanctions in Iran as he believes they have been very effective. And crippling sanctions are something I called for five years ago when I was in Israel speaking at the Herzliya conference. I laid out seven steps. Crippling sanctions were number one, and they do work. You're seeing it right now in the economy. It's absolutely the right thing to do to have crippling sanctions. I'd have put them in place earlier, but it's good that we have them. President Obama defended his record, saying the following. When it comes to tightening sanctions, as I said before, we've put in the toughest, most crippling sanctions ever. Indeed, crippling sanctions have had a large impact on Iranian society. They have been very effective in increasing starvation, food riots, medicine shortages, and pervasive unemployment, which has caused the intense suffering of 75 million Iranian citizens. So who is being targeted here? 
just six years ago when putting together a strategy that would pressure Iran to come clean about its nuclear program, the United States and its European allies agreed to employ, quote, smart sanctions that would solely target the government as they had no quarrels with Iranian civilians. Washington and its allies have since employed general sanctions that targeted a wide variety of banks and companies and extensively restricted trade to and from Iran, most notably implementing an embargo on Iranian oil. Now it is the Iranian people, not their government, who are suffering under the sanctions imposed in response to Iran's intransigence. We can justify our decision to not believe the Iranian government's peaceful declarations, but we are still faced with the question of how to effectively react to the potential threat posed by Iran's nuclear program. Short of military intervention, economic sanctions are one of the only tools available to policymakers to compel Iran to change course. Unfortunately, Iran's government did not agree to an IAEA inspection of its nuclear facilities in May, deepening concern over the state's intentions. Still, why employ sanctions that target the population? In general, sanctions have historically been intended to weaken the opposition. Even if the probability for policy change in the targeted country is minimal, economic sanctions can still be successful in signaling displeasure to the immediate transgressor and even incite displeasure amongst their domestic population that could lead to revolt. Often, the idea behind broad-based economic sanctions is that the citizens will link their economic hardship brought on by the sanctions with the political injustice of their regime and thus react by revolting against their government. The most recent economic sanctions aimed to cripple the economy enough to send a message to Iran's leadership to halt its nuclear program. But will targeting the population really achieve that goal? It is pertinent to remember that Iran has an authoritarian regime that is not easily affected by public opinion, short of a public uprising. It is true that sanctions can often be used to incite a revolt against the government, but it is also possible that targeting the people will instead foster anti-American sentiment that could lead to negative repercussions. We can only hope that a better solution can be negotiated by whoever becomes president so innocent lives do not have to continue suffering. Dana Terry, The Global Current. And now a piece on the U.S. presidential foreign policy debate. Staffer Adam Brigdorf files this report. In the final debate, President Obama made some hard swings at Governor Romney's foreign policy. During the debate, President Obama had this to say. Cold War has been over for 20 years. But, Governor, you know, when it comes to our foreign policy, you seem to want to import the foreign policies of the 1980s, just like the social policies of the 1950s and the economic policies of the 1920s. You say that you're not interested in duplicating what happened in Iraq. But just a few weeks ago, you said you think we should have more troops in Iraq right now. Every time you've offered an opinion, you've been wrong. But is this assessment of Governor Romney's foreign policy style accurate? Let's examine some of the key aspects of Governor Romney's foreign policy. On the issue of Syria and how the United States might proceed, Governor Romney had this to say about the Syrian rebels. Uh, I don't think there's a necessity to put our military uh, in Syria at, at this stage. I don't anticipate that in the future. As I indicated, our objectives are to replace Assad and to have in place a new government which is friendly to us, a responsible government if, if possible, and I want to make sure they get armed and they have the arms necessary to defend themselves but also to, to, remove, uh, to remove Assad. But I do not want to see a military involvement on the part of, of, our, of our troops uh, and this, this, isn't, this isn't going to be necessary. In addition to the statements made during the debate, Mr. Romney's campaign website makes strong note of Romney's support of the Iranian opposition and cites President Obama's lack of support for the 2009 election protests as a failure of American policy. Mr. Romney's plans do share many key components with the Reagan Doctrine, which offered U.S. political support to anti-communist movements and supplied anti-communist guerrillas with arms in an effort to roll back rather than contain the spread of communism. Even Mr. Romney's statement that Russia is America's number one geopolitical foe, though qualified by an emphasis on Iran's threat, could be argued to be outdated considering the rise of China. Governor Romney's policy statements also expose another core belief in his foreign policy strategy, that of peace through strength. On October 19, 1980, President Reagan said this during the campaign. Peace is made by the fact of strength, economic military and strategic. Peace is lost when such strength disappears, or just as bad, is seen by an adversary. Compare that to statements made by Governor Romney nearly 32 years to the day later. 
For us to be able to promote principles of peace requires us to be strong. And that begins with a strong economy here at home. And unfortunately, the economy is not stronger. When the, when the, uh, the president of, of, of Iran, Ahmadinejad, says that our debt makes us not a great country, uh, that's a frightening thing. Governor Romney's website criticizes President Obama's reduction in the size of America's Navy and Air Force and lays out plans to place a 4% of GDP floor on military spending to ensure America is able to meet its commitments to maintaining peace abroad. But battleships and bayonets aside, not all of the governor's foreign policies are a blast from the past. Romney surprised many analysts over his strong support of democratic institution building in post-conflict states, as well as his calls for international involvement in settling many of these conflicts, which offers a stark contrast to the American unilateralism of the 1980s. And Governor Romney stood with President Obama on the issue of strong sanctions against Iran, sanctions first implemented in 1987. While President Obama argued that many of Governor Romney's policies stem from the 1980s, Mr. Romney does not rely solely on these policies and offers a mixed selection of contemporary ideas as well. Voters will be the ones to ultimately decide whether Romney's policies are outdated and which direction America will take for the next four years. Adam Bergdorf, The Global Current. And now editor John Hensel examines the presidential candidate's positions on Asia, or lack thereof. In last Monday's debate, both presidential candidates sparred intensely over their policies for the Middle East, nominally seeking to reassure allies across the globe about the future trajectory of American foreign policy. However, both candidates were troublingly quiet in respect to how America should be confronting Asia's challenges in the coming century, leaving our oldest and dearest allies out in the cold. Despite President Obama's pivot to Asia policy, a dramatic re-envisioning of America's strategic posture for the coming century, the only discussion of the Asia-Pacific region revolved around economic competition with China. The candidates' myopic use of Asia as code for their economic and job platforms ignores the crucial issues facing our allies in the region. If the debate is any indication of the next four years, the leaders of America's friends and allies in Asia should be seriously concerned about the next president's commitment to the region, and possibly asking, what makes Israel more important than us? Even though each candidate discussed their China policy, neither discussed the strategic challenge that China poses to the United States, Japan, Taiwan, or a host of Southeast Asian states. As China's economic growth and military modernizations continue over the next few decades, it is well understood in Washington that China can rival the United States' power in Asia and eventually in the world. President Obama's pivot policy and Governor Romney's recent call to create more nuclear submarines underscore the implicit acceptance of the strategic reality that America faces more threats than just terror groups. But let's hear what the candidates have to say about China. Uh, China has an interest that's very much like ours in one respect, and that is they want a stable world. They don't want war. They don't want to see uh, protectionism. They don't want to see uh, the, the world uh, break out into, into various forms of chaos because they have, to, they have to manufacture goods and put people to work. They have about 20, 000, 20 million rather, people coming out of the farms every year, coming into the cities, needing jobs. So they want the economy to work and the world to be free and open. And so we can be a partner with China. We don't have to be an adversary in any way, shape, or form. We can work with them. We can collaborate with them if they're willing to be responsible. Given those statements, the next president of the United States has no qualm about jumping in bed with China so long as they follow the economic rules of international trade. While issues of copyright infringement are no laughing matter in today's innovation-driven marketplace, there are far more important issues to consider or so blithely accepting China. What of China's track record with human rights? What of Beijing's increasing assertiveness in the East and South China Seas, including a naval standoff with our ally the Philippines? What of Beijing's blind eye towards another regional challenge, an already nuclear North Korea, that's facing our ally South Korea? What of the nationalist furor that swept across China in the form of violent demonstrations against our ally Japan only a month and a half ago? If the candidates set out in Monday's debate to reassure our allies of America's commitment, both accomplished the reverse in Asia. The singular focus on China as just an economic problem may play well in swing states come election day, but it should leave our friends in Asia feeling a little bit abandoned and more than a bit worried. John Hensel, The Global Current. Vitaly Klitschko, the world's heavyweight boxing champion from Ukraine, is turning his attention away from the boxing ring and towards the political circle of the Ukrainian parliament. Klitschko is known throughout Europe not only through his boxing but through his many product endorsements. 
Klitschko is now the leader of an opposition party, the Ukrainian Democratic Alliance for Reforms. Many are claiming that the government led by President Viktor Yanukovych engages in political suppression by imprisoning opposition leaders and censoring the press. Reformers hope that due to Klitschko's public status, the government will be less likely to imprison him for fear of greater public criticism. In a recent speech, Klitschko explained the goals of his party as well as denounced the corruption among the current authorities. He pushed the facts that under the Yanukovych government, Ukraine is severely economically, industrially, and socially lacking behind its Eastern European counterparts, such as its neighbor to the West, Poland. He said that, quote, Six million Ukrainians do not see a future for themselves in this country and are looking for jobs abroad. Seventy percent of young people want to leave this country and live abroad. His aims are to create jobs, increase wages and pensions for workers, and promote internal growth in the Ukraine. Ukraine, a former Soviet republic, is still trying to prove that their government is in full support of democracy. Having steel as their main export, Ukraine is struggling severely to keep up with Europe's demand for their goods leading them towards economic trouble. Political corruption also does not help the effort for economic growth, with taxpayer money going towards the regions in the Ukraine where high-ranking officials live to build golf courses and residential compounds. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has recently been quoted as describing the situation in the Ukraine as worrying. In order to promote a fair, democratic election, this corruption must be eliminated. Maybe a boxing champion is just what the Ukraine needs right now to do so. The Ukrainian parliamentary election will take place on October 28, 2012. Cameron Brown, The Global Current. Staffer Heidi Erbsen interviews Seton Hall adjunct professors Raymond Brown and Wanda Akin Brown on their recent visit to The Hague. Recently you were in The Hague. Can you tell us a little bit about what your activities there involved? We were in The Hague to follow up on a case that we have in The Hague. We represent victims of the Darfur situation and in the case against Omar al-Bashir, the president of Sudan. Right now, we are acting in the capacity of representing victims. We are two of about 50 American lawyers who are qualified and are on what's called the list of counsel capable of representing parties at The Hague. And there was a meeting of the list of counsel last week and we were there for those meetings and we also took meetings with various organs and administrators of the court concerning our clients who we represent at the International Criminal Court. You also have a project called the International Justice Project and how does that tie in with your work at the International Criminal Court? Well, the International Criminal Court is a court that is supported by the states that entered into a treaty. And while its budget is in the 20 or so million dollars a year, it doesn't adequately fund either the defense function or the function of legal representatives. And so NGOs, non-government organizations, frequently are actively engaged with the court. What we wound up doing was building our own NGO in order to support our work with the court. And that NGO, which is called the International Justice Project, has a number of projects, including the direct support of our work as legal representatives. We also have an emergency network which provides some basic services or at least help connect some of the Darfurian communities around the country to basic services. And we recently, just last week in Boston, after returning from the Netherlands, launched HARP, which is a project designed to uh, work in conjunction with Boston College and sociologists and doctors to really ferret out what are the psychological and other harms that have been visited on Darfurians who are, after all, the victims of genocide. And then finally, we have a program called Chasing Bashir, which is part of our effort to help galvanize the international community, small as we may be, in the effort to bring the president of the Sudan, who's been charged with genocide, but who is still at large, to bring him to the dock. Yeah. You noted four main programs that the International Justice Project has. Can you tell us what's the main goal of any program that you launch? Well, and that's the beauty of being in this as a married couple, as well as co-teachers and as co-counsel as lawyers. If you've been in our class, you would note that in this growing area of the practice of international criminal law worldwide, where lots of envelopes are being pushed and at the International Criminal Court, which is a relatively new court, it's only 10 years old, there are no 
solidly right answers or wrong answers about how to run the court or ultimately what the end goal of the court is. The court slogan is to end impunity, but we look at the International Justice Project as an organization that supports global justice. That's whether uh, we represent victims, whether we're seeking transitional justice, whether we're pursuing peacemaking and building up of civil society and conflict areas, and even where we may represent accused to support our efforts in that regard. Primarily now our focus in international justice is on our work in survivor communities in the diaspora. Okay, and uh, Wanda, you spoke about your program Chasing Bashir. Can you briefly inform listeners who may not be familiar with the complications in capturing Bashir and having him subjected to the jurisdiction of the ICC? The case against Omar al-Bashir, the sitting president of the Sudan, was initially referred by the UN Security Council to the International Criminal Court. and. The first chief prosecutor investigated Bashir. Initially, they sought arrest warrants against two other men, and they did obtain those arrest warrants against Harun and Kushayab. A little later on, there was the announcement that they were investigating the president and were going to seek an arrest warrant. So Bashir has been indicted on charges of genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. And he's not in the dock at The Hague. The International Criminal Court relies on cooperation by its member states. Those are states that have signed the Rome Treaty to bring the people who've been indicted by the court to answer those charges. And that hasn't been done as a matter of fact, Bashir and Sudan have flaunted the indictment of the president by the International Criminal Court prosecutor. And we feel that these charges are uh, very serious charges and that member states, that is states that uh, have signed on to the treaty, have an obligation to arrest him and send him to The Hague. Raymond may have some additional insight, as he usually does. I doubt if it's additional insight, but the first point is that people should not be discouraged. This is a young court. It's a controversial court, and the nation states that have chosen not to cooperate, and we take the position both that the members states that have signed the treaty, the states' parties have an obligation to turn him over, but all member states of the UN have an obligation to turn him over, since this is a referral, his case, from the Security Council. There are a variety of reasons why cooperation has not been fully forthcoming. <clears throat> the first is that the international court, in a way, poses a challenge to the notion of absolute sovereignty. And there are some states that still blanch at the notion of a head of state, particularly a sitting head of state, being brought to account in a trial, uh, especially a fair trial, at an international court. So there are some who have uh, a sort of a principled concern. There are also those who don't wish the principle of impunity to be pushed because they know themselves to be vulnerable. Uh, there are nations that have complicated bilateral relations with the Sudan. For example, our government, uh, the United States government, which on the one hand, um, in the form of uh, Secretary of State Powell was the first, one among the first to call this a genocide and which even though the United States is not a party to the Rome Treaty, um, supported a resolution to have him go to um, to have the matter referred to the uh, ICC. On the other hand, the United States has very close security ties with the government of Sudan. So the question of the extent to which the United States presses to have him go to the court, and we're not the only country that's ambivalent in this way. But a positive example would be the small country of Malawi. Malawi last summer was scheduled to host the annual meeting of the AU, the African Union Summit. Uh, the president of Malawi received massive pressure from donor countries to not have Bashir come. And she said, if he comes, we'll arrest him. And as a consequence, the AU summit was moved to Ethiopia. So that's a small victory, but it shows that pressure can make a difference. And if you take the long view, Charles Taylor was sought for many years by the special court for Sierra Leone and ultimately came there to account. 
um, Slobodan Milosevic was sought for a long time by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Eventually he came there, as did the former Bosnian Serb President uh, Radovan Karadzic. So taking the long view, it is likely that sooner or later Bashir will come to the court and face justice. But pressure will make a difference. It's good to remember that the Rome Treaty itself which led to the establishment of this court in 2002, was really the result of pressure from civil society, ordinary people organized around the globe, who pushed initially like-minded governments and then other governments into a treaty that many of them were reluctant to support. So it's a process that requires all of our continued commitment, our continued awareness of circumstances like the Darfur genocide, and our own obligation to be actively engaged and to not forget that genocide or the horrible things that are happening to other Sudanese right now at the hands of this very same uh, kleptocratic government. Okay, well on that note, I want to thank you both for taking the time to come and interview and informing us all about what's still going on in Darfur and what we can do to help. But as professors at Seton Hall, on a final note, if there was one thing that you could tell your students from your experiences about your successes or failures, about what they need to do to stay informed and to keep helping the international community, what would you say? Well, you've probably heard this uh, before. Students need to be informed. And in this information age, there are just so many outlets. Uh, first, we tell all of our students that they have to read the newspaper of record not only on class days, but every day, uh, to know what's going on uh, in the world around them. But the New York Times isn't the only uh, media outlet or periodical or newspaper uh, that has uh, good information. There are so many sources, and you don't have to delve uh, too deeply to um, have a basic working knowledge of uh, what's going on in your, in your world. And we think that being informed, being educated about the basic things that are happening on the international scale or in, in the uh, international community every day is just so important, especially uh, for students who are educated in a religious community uh, such as Seton Hall. Uh, to look outside uh, oneself, outside one's immediate community, to pay attention to the other, um, to pay attention to the least of these, um, doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a lot to pay attention to and have concern about other people. Uh, it's important in the short run, you should come and hang out with us at International Justice Project, but in the long run, I think it's really important to think in terms of craft. That is, you're at school, and you should come away with school, from school with a craft that enables you not just to earn a living, but to contribute. I mean, we've been given the opportunity of meeting some remarkable people and perhaps being a small part of a very big struggle against genocide. Not because we're the most brilliant human rights strategists there ever were, but because we were lawyers whose skills were needed. So there have been many people who've taken a stand, and we hope that people who listen to this conversation will say, gee, I had sort of forgotten about the Darfur. What's happening? We'll learn about it. Come visit our website. Come talk to Wanda and I. We're here on the campus all the time. We have an office in Newark. Uh, we do answer the email. And uh, we think that it's important that people stay engaged because at the end of the day, it's only when ordinary people become outraged. Uh, we urge people to respond, uh, to get involved, uh, because it's only by their actions that there can be a countermeasure to men who sit in comfortable places, steal countries blind, impose their will on millions of human beings, and are willing to destroy whole ways of life in order to have their own way. It can be stopped. Well, again, I want to thank you both for coming out, and hopefully you've helped to inspire some of our listeners and our students, and I wish you the best of luck in your future campaigns. So, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Heidi. For more information about the International Justice Project and projects in Darfur, you can visit Mr. Raymond Brown and Mrs. Wanda Akin Brown's organizational website at www.internationaljusticeproject.com. To hear more of this interview, visit our website at blogs.shu.edu slash globalcurrent, or like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or check out our YouTube channel. I'm Kumar Ahmed, And I'm Cameron Brown for the Global Cards.